morning, everybody. Uh, thanks again, not just for coming in on a rainy day, but for coming in the other 364 days of the year where we're routinely poking and prodding and challenging you. Uh, so we, again, we can't do any of this without you. I just want to give you a quick update on our cognitive aging program. So uh, uh, given the last, I guess since I've spoken last, we now have uh, two new uh, grants from the NIH, specifically targeting uh, typical aging. We have a, an, a, an aging network grant uh, graciously provided by the Larry Hillbloom Foundation. Um, and these grants are really providing the funds for all those research coordinators who are calling you up all the time, inviting you to come in for you know, the various tortures that we have in store for you. Um, other general updates. So the program has really grown quite nicely over the, you know, the course of, uh, of the program. We've had over 800 folks come in and participate. We actively follow uh, around 500 folks. We are really sort of gearing up with the, the, the amyloid imaging that Howie referred to. So we're probably doing 10 amyloid scans a month. We're doing at least 20 to t uh, 25 MRI scans a month. We um, are, uh, you know, one of the grants that we have is specifically focused on inflammation. And I've talked before about the impact that, that chronic inflammation can have on brain structure and brain function. So as we speak, we have about a thousand blood samples in the lab now that are being processed for a whole host of really key inflammatory molecules. So we're very, very excited about that. We are now developing an outreach program to target underrepresented populations, and you're going to hear about that. Um, in a little bit. And the goal of the program continues to be preventing the onset of any of these neurodegenerative syndromes um, as we age and to optimize or maximize the ways in which our brains work. That's the goal. That's the target. And that's, um, but that's not really what I, what I want to talk about today. Uh, what I, how do I do this? There we go. Um, all right. So I want to talk about cognitive activity. So, because we're always being asked about this. People come in and say, well, you know, should I be doing crossword puzzles? Should I be reading more? Should I be going to the more museums? Uh, uh, you know, wh what should I do to keep my brain really, really healthy? Um, and not only do people ask about whether they should engage in more cognitively stimulating activities, but they also ask, you know, should we be participating in some of these brain exercise programs that you can do online. And I'm just kind of curious, raise your hand if you've done a cognitive exercise or training thing online. Keep your hand up if it was with Lumosity. So you probably know that Lumosity got dinged a couple million bucks from the FDA because of overreaching claims. You know, so it really the bottom line is that uh, Lumosity doesn't really know if some of these things are really great for your brain. And you know what? Neither do I. <laughs> that, that's the short answer. Okay. Um, but just because there has been insufficient evidence to support it is not the same as evidence against it. In other words, the jury is still out. So let's talk about this a little bit. So I think there's tremendous reason to be optimistic, right? Um, the, the, Fifty years ago, Marion Diamond, who was at Berkeley, and her colleagues started doing some really important experiments uh, with, uh, with uh, stimulation. So they worked with rats, and they uh, had a great paradigm where they had rats in two different conditions, sort of a standard condition, which is the cage on the left, which is not a whole lot going on, and over to the right, they had a stim you know, an enriched environment for, for some of the rats. And as you can see, you know, there are more rats in there, so there's more things going on socially, there's more stuff to do, so they're more physically active. Presumably, yeah, there's a little library in the back you can't see, so they're more cognitively enriched. Um, uh, the enriched environment is in color, the standard one's in black and white. Yeah, so you can see there are really tremendous differences. The findings were absolutely phenomenal, right? Um, they found that the brains of the, mice, of the rats that were in the enriched environment were larger, the neurons were larger. The neurons had more connections with other neurons. So there was more of these dendrites that enabled synaptic connections uh, with, um, you know, with other neurons. So you know, this was really a phenomenal finding. Also, 
It didn't take a lot of time in the enriched environments to produce that effect. And what's particularly important for us is that even if she took an older rat and put it into the enriched environment, you still got enhancements to brain structure. So very, very exciting stuff. And this is what, like, we've known about this for 50 years. So what was it about these enriched environments that really does the trick? And yeah, we don't really know that. So as I mentioned, they were more physically enriched, they were more cognitively enriched, they were more socially enriched. Now, we've already been preaching for a long time about the importance of increasing the level of physical activity. There's no question that that's good for the brain, it lowers inflammation, it produces growth factors that stimulate neurogenesis. So physical activity, I think we're pretty well on board with. But what about this cognitive activity stuff? So this is what we're a little less clear, but I want to give you some glimmers. So this is something we're starting to look at, and I want you to give you some of the hints that we've uh, uh, started coming up with and you know, are giving us some lines of research that we want to pursue going forward. I should also mention that Adam Ghazali, a colleague of the Marian Aging Center who's in our same building, uh, is also very devoted to thinking about ways of using a mix of cognitive and physical enrichment to uh, maximize uh, brain aging. Um, so this is some exploratory work done by Caitlin Casaletto, who's going to be a uh, postdoctoral fellow in our group for the next couple of years and is you know, been a really a dynamic young researcher. So it's kind of a busy slide, but when we get to the sort of the punchline is that she looked at all of the, the we, we, we have these cognitive activity questionnaires that everybody fills out and uh, it, it maps cognitive activity across the lifespan and she noticed, so she noticed that there's a you know, a group of around 75 people who were more cognitively active now than they were when they were younger. And she matched those to about 100 folks who really didn't change their level of cognitive activity. And she found a couple of things that were very striking, that the group who showed an increase in their cognitive activity now relative to earlier did better, significantly better on measures of executive functioning and memory. Um, not only did they do better cross-sectionally, but when she looked at rates of change in these abilities over time, they showed better change over time. And what was also very reassuring was that she found that they had some larger brain volumes. In, and this is just you know, data from the frontal lobes. So again, very exciting. Again, this is just observational data and it's not definitive. Another thing that's not really definitive is a little pilot study we did uh, several months ago, and some of you may have participated. The study was really designed to see if we could improve cognition in patients who had mild cognitive problems associated with vascular disease or Parkinson's disease, but we had a control group. So basically, people come in, they got the you know, pre-experiment testing, and then they, were, they spent a few weeks with, a, with an iPad and this is something that was programmed by a group out in the East Coast um, where, and you know, I'm sorry I don't have a good video of it, but sometimes the video makes people a little motion sick, uh, that you're sitting there and you're, you're driving, you're, you know, you're avoiding all these icebergs, and, and then every once in a while these big fish fly out, and if it's a certain color fish, you have to blast it. Uh, so you're doing lots of things uh, at the same time. Uh, and, uh, so it's a really you know, good working memory exercise. And what we found in some of the patient groups is that we saw improvements in working memory. And when we looked at our controls, we also found that relative to pre-training, we saw some significant improvements in how well they performed on sort of cognitive control uh, measures. So again, this is just that, you know, this was an open label experiment. You know, we, everyone knew what they were doing. So I think what this speaks to is our need to start doing randomized clinical trials for cognitive training exercises. So this is something that I think that we hope to be doing going forward um, uh, and integrating these sorts of things with the multitude of other ways in which we're trying to, you know, capture that essence of cognitive aging to, uh, you know, keep us all uh, as, as mentally and physically fit as possible going forward. So again, thank you for your attention and for your participation for, for all these years. Did you say that working memory was just a test case? I did not, but um, I don't have any time. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, how well we can mentally manipulate information, multitask and, 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 and ignore irrelevant stimuli. How's that? All right.
Um, now, one of the things that we now know is important for, I don't know, this is, I'm leading up to McGill's talk, he's next, right? Is, uh, you know, we know that, that life experiences are really important for maximizing cognitive aging. And one of the things that happens when we're younger that's probably good to avoid is getting banged on the head a lot. <laughs> so our next speaker, I believe, is Gil Rabinovich, um, who's gonna be talking a little bit about our experience with concussions.